Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live astronomy program. My name is Justin. I'm one of the astronomers at the Science Museum of Virginia, and I'm happy to be your guide for today's show. If you've watched some of the previous episodes, welcome back. Always uh, happy to see you on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, if you haven't seen our previous broadcasts, they're all recorded and archived right here on uh, our, uh, our Facebook page. You can just go to the video section. Uh, I think uh, there are 13 previous episodes you can watch to catch up. Uh, but today's show, it's okay if you, you stay uh, tuned into today's broadcast. Uh, you don't have to watch those previous episodes to enjoy today's show. Uh, today's show is all about your questions. I'm pulling even more questions out of the archives and uh, have a little list that was submitted last week. So if you want to help plan next week's show, uh, if you come up with a, a question during today's show or there's something about space that uh, has always made you curious, leave it in the comments down below and I may be able to get to it in next week's show or, or somewhere down the line. Before we do get started, a couple of notes for you. As always, need to thank our sponsors for this series, Allianz Partners. Happy to have them on board. Uh, also, uh, during today's show, we're going to be watching uh, a lot of video created by uh, Planetarium Software, a lot like the one we use at the Science Museum in the Dome theater. Uh, it is uh, created by Evans and Sutherland. Uh, it can do some pretty cool stuff, so if you're able to, I recommend making this video full screen, watching it on a nice big monitor. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, in fact, to uh, get the show started, I'm going to switch us over to the Digistar software and show you something brand new, something that uh, just happened last weekend. Uh, so, last weekend, an asteroid flew pretty close to the Earth. The, uh, uh, the red line you're seeing on your screen is the flight path of that asteroid. Uh, this is the closest known approach by an asteroid uh, that didn't end in a collision. So asteroids have certainly gotten closer to the Earth. Uh, all of the closer ones just hit the surface of our planet or, or enter the atmosphere. This was a pretty small asteroid. If it had entered the atmosphere, uh, it should have just burned up, made a nice uh, fireball in the sky. Uh, it was about uh, estimated to be about uh, three to five meters across, so uh, and maybe about the size of a car or, or a large truck. So uh, uh, not a huge rock. Uh, would have been a nice light show. If it had hit. Uh, but uh, as always, is a good reminder to uh, keep an eye out for those little members of the solar system. Uh, not a full bit today, but uh, we'll come back for more asteroids in the future, I am sure. Uh, no, today's show is, uh, is all about your questions and, and the things that uh, you have asked about, uh, things you put in the comments every week, uh, as well as uh, some older questions I've got from our Ask an Astronomer series. So uh, let's address some of those today. Uh, a lot of these are going to be uh, kind of focused on our place in the universe and our galaxy. Uh, th that's our home in space. So I'm going to start right here at uh, at least the Science Museum's home in Richmond. There is the, uh, the Science Museum itself. I've got things set up for uh, a view as it will appear later on tonight. So I'm just going to shift us up to actually see the sky. Now, this is one of the best times of year to, uh, to go out stargazing, if you ask me. Some of my favorite things in the whole nighttime sky are, uh, are out for you in the evening right now. And uh, this view is what the sky should look like all about 10 o'clock this evening, and a couple hours after the sun sets, once it gets nice and dark outside. Uh, the, uh, the first question I wanted to answer is uh, one that uh, you may have thought a lot about if you've ever gone out on a nice clear night to, uh, to do a little bit of stargazing. Uh, I'm just going to answer a question that was submitted by Serenity who, who sent in a couple questions from her kids and uh, the kids ask, why do stars twinkle? Ah, a classic place to start. Okay, well uh, stars twinkle because of Earth's atmosphere. The, uh, the mixture of gases that are all around us close to Earth's surface here and, and up above our heads. Uh, of course the atmosphere contains oxygen which we need to breathe. That's pretty good but it kind of gets in the way 
of astronomy. So you've probably noticed the stars twinkle in the nighttime sky before, and they are twinkling on your screen right now. It might be kind of hard to see, so I'm going to just exaggerate everything. That's a nice thing about the software. I've got more or less complete control over the universe, so let's make all the stars really huge. And uh, you can now see that they sort of flicker. They, uh, they change in brightness, and uh, some of them appear to change color as well. That's, uh, that's what's going on with real stars in the sky also. Uh, so, so why does that happen? Well, uh, all the gases in the atmosphere behave as a fluid. Uh, in, in physics, we can describe both gases and liquids as fluids. Uh, they all move and behave in similar ways, follow the same mathematical formulas. Uh, you know, uh, you can visualize the way air moves sometimes. Uh, here's a video from NASA uh, where a supersonic jet is flying in front of the sun. And you can actually see waves created in the atmosphere, in the gases around us, by this jet. You know, they were especially obvious when they crossed the edges of the sun. Uh, now, you don't have to be a supersonic jet to make waves in the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is constantly uh, absorbing energy from the sun, uh, energy radiated back from uh, the Earth after it absorbs energy from the sun. So the gases around us are always moving around. Uh, if you've ever ridden on an airplane, you know that turbulent air can give you a rough ride uh, if you're moving through the air. Uh, and the same thing happens to starlight at night. As it moves through our atmosphere, the, the motion of the air gives that starlight kind of a, a, a rough ride before it gets to our eyes. It's, it's not so different from another effect you may have seen this summer. If you've been underwater and you've seen sunlight streaming through the surface of a, a swimming pool, a lake, a river, something like that, uh, the same kind of thing is happening. Uh, the, the light from the sun is just being refracted and bounced around uh, by the motion of the water when you're underwater. But uh, when you're just under the atmosphere, it can affect the, uh, the path to light as well. And because the stars we see at night are so far away, there are these little tiny points of light in the sky. Uh, if, uh, if their path is uh, moved around by, uh, by the motion of the air, uh, then that is what makes the stars kind of appear to blink out for just a second or, or some of the light to, of some colors to be refracted different amounts. So the so stars kind of uh, seem to change color. So, so there you go. Stars just twinkling because of the atmosphere. But if I, if I exaggerate things on your screen, again, take a close look. Uh, there are two dots that are behaving just a little bit differently there. Uh, there are two just a little bit left and above center. Uh, those two were not twinkling. And that must be because they are just a little bit different. Uh, those are both planets. When we see planets in the nighttime sky, they do not twinkle. Uh, and that's because the, the planets are actually close enough to us so they look a little bit bigger in the sky. If you've ever seen a planet through a telescope, you, you know what I'm talking about. They look like little circles, little disks uh, in, in the telescope. The stars still look like little tiny points. Uh, the planets are still affected by the motions of, uh, of the gases in Earth's atmosphere. You can see it in this little, uh, little video clip here. The planet is still kind of jumping around, and especially around the edges, that shape still gets distorted a little bit. Uh, but because it's bigger than the, uh, the stars appear in the sky, uh, we still, on average, see about the same amount of light reflected off of all of the planets, so they stay pretty steady uh, in the sky, unless you have a, a telescope to watch them with. And you might be noticing uh, another little effect in this video clip. If you've seen a planet through a telescope, you may have noticed that they tend to be just a little bit blurry. And that's because we're looking through Earth's atmosphere as well. Uh, the, the, the turbulence in the air that, that makes stars twinkle, it makes everything in the sky look just a little bit blurry when you look at it through a telescope. So if you want a really good view of something like a planet in the sky, you know, uh, if you get above some of the atmosphere, that helps. Uh, so uh, here is an example of a picture uh, taken by a, uh, a group of uh, amateur and professional astronomers uh, working together. Uh, they traveled up into the French mountains, they waited for nice clear nights, and uh, got some fairly lucky shots of Jupiter. So this is probably about uh, as good as you can do from the surface of the Earth. And uh, that's pretty good, especially if you're watching on a, on a small screen. That probably looks 
are really good to you. You probably have no complaints about that picture. Uh, but if you have uh, a telescope even higher, if you're up in space, the Hubble Space Telescope, because it's almost uh, because it's above almost all of Earth's atmosphere, uh, you don't even have to get lucky to get a nice clear picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, now that its optics have been corrected, but that's another story. Uh, now, uh, pictures from Hubble are crystal clear all the time because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, the motion of the atmosphere. So uh, that is why astronomers love using space telescopes so much, because the pictures look much better. Uh, all right, so, uh, so that stars twinkling, little bonus information on planets. Uh, I showed you that, that there were two planets in the sky this evening. Let me tell you which ones they are. This is facing south about uh, 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, those two bright objects in the southern sky that are not twinkling will be the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter, the brighter of the two. It's about uh, half the distance from Earth as, uh, as Saturn. So enjoy those planets if you're able to this evening, if it uh, stays clear enough around here. Now, maybe this weekend it'll be clear as well. You'll still be able to see those planets. And if uh, you live a little farther from the city, and maybe you're out in the county somewhere, or maybe you're taking a camping trip out in the mountains, uh, look just off to the right of those planets, and you may see a fuzzy band of light stretching across the sky. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit in some of our previous episodes. Uh, that is, of course, the Milky Way. And uh, that has inspired some questions as well. Uh, one question was submitted to us by Laura, who asks, why is the Milky Way called the Milky Way? An excellent question. Uh, a lot of things in astronomy have interesting names. And uh, you know, sometimes the reasons behind those names are fairly obvious sometimes not so much. Now, uh, one part of the answer I can give you is that uh, we call it the Milky Way uh, because of where we live on the planet. Uh, here in the Western world, uh, we refer to it as the Milky Way because uh, we pick up a lot of our astronomical names and traditions from the ancient Greeks. Now, uh, the ancient Greeks looked up at the sky and uh, they saw in that fuzzy band of light uh, uh, something that kind of reminded them of milk. So they actually called it the Milky Circle. Uh, that was their, uh, their their name for it. Now, I could give you the modern explanation and just let you know, as we zoom in here on real images taken as part of the digitized sky survey, uh, that if you have a nice big telescope here on the Earth, you zoom in on the Milky Way, all you're going to see are more and more stars. If you go back a few weeks in our video archive, uh, you'll see a show where we kind of explored the Milky Way. We talked about the hundreds of billions of stars that make up our galaxy. And it's just the, the combined light of all of those stars that, uh, that makes the Milky Way in our sky. But for the ancient Greeks, it was a little bit different. Uh, their explanation of the Milky Way has less to do with billions of distant stars and uh, more to do with uh, uh, the goddess Hera, the queen of the gods. Uh, she was actually nursing a, a human infant named Heracles. If you prefer Roman legends, that's, uh, that's Hercules. Uh, so Heracles is nursing, right? And uh, uh, from this, he's supposed to get some godlike qualities. But by some accounts, his bite was already pretty strong. Uh, he was able to bite uh, hard enough to startle Hera. And uh, as a result of the startled goddess uh, Heracles unlatches, and the result is a stream of milk that's sprayed across the sky. That's, that's quite a story, certainly. I, I think I can make a little more sense of, uh, of the billions of stars. But, but that's the way they saw it. As strange as that story sounds to us, it made perfect sense for the ancient Greeks. And it, it helped explain this one special feature of the sky, this milky circle that stretched over their heads. It was one of 11 different circles they traced out in the sky. You may know some of the others. Uh, there's the ecliptic, where, uh, where all the uh, other planets and sun and moon move in the sky. It's also called the zodiac. Uh, uh, you've got the Tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, the Arctic Circles, there are, are a few others. So uh, just one of their, uh, their many contributions to the astronomical traditions we still use today. Uh, they invented a lot of the constellations we still use here in the Western world as well. But uh, in some parts of the world, the, the name 
for the Milky Way is a little bit different. In some places, uh, it's connected to straw. And this is especially true in some parts of Central Asia and Africa. Uh, they tell legends about travelers on a road uh, that drop straw along their path. Uh, in other parts of the world, they they ignored the uh, the traveler and the straw. It is simply a road that connects the Earth to the sky. So, lots of possible explanations for uh, for what the Milky Way is. It's kind of a historical and uh, mythological accident that uh, we call it the Milky Way uh, where we live now. Uh, in fact, when we call the Milky Way a galaxy, we're also uh, kind of paying homage to the uh, the Greek tradition. Uh, the Greek phrase for uh, for Milky Circle, as they called the Milky Way, uh, that first word is uh, just what we turned into the word galaxy. So anytime you call anything a galaxy, uh, you're just uh, making a callback to the ancient Greeks. And of course there are uh, there are many other galaxies out there. Uh, let's see, somewhere around here there should be another big galaxy that's, that's relatively close to us. Uh, it is our closest large neighbor in the universe. I'm searching out the Andromeda galaxy. See if I can find it on the screen for you. And uh, a lot of the other questions that were submitted uh, last week had to do with galaxies and, uh, and the scale of the universe, things like that. So uh, just kind of for fun, I'm going to zoom in on the Andromeda galaxy before we move on. Uh, all right, so there's another galaxy for you. Um, so uh, the other galaxies like Andromeda here, it's, it's some uh, two and a half million light years away from us. Uh, these objects are pretty remote in space. And, and one of the big challenges that uh, astronomers face all the time, and, and the big question I put in the, uh, the description for you uh, on this show, is uh, whether you've ever really thought about how big the universe is. So uh, I'm going to use a little bit of the time today to try and get to the bottom of that. And I uh, had a little bit of help in the comments last week. I uh, had some questions, uh, especially from Howard, who asked a lot about the universe. I think I've turned it into a decent little exploration of uh, how we measure uh, the space around us. So let's start here. Uh, one of Howard's first questions was uh, how the expansion of the universe was measured in really large units involving megaparsecs. He asked if that could be translated into the human scale. Well, the short answer is no, but uh, I've got a few more minutes uh, here with you, so I'll give you the long answer. That's very difficult to translate megaparsecs into the human scale because this was a unit that was created to describe the universe, which is huge, but uh, it's not going to stop me from trying. So uh, let's take a closer look at, uh, at mega parsecs uh, first. Let me tell you that uh, this is a compound word. So we've got a, a prefix and then a unit. Mega is the prefix and then parsec is the actual unit we're talking about. Uh, mega just means we're talking about a million of these things. Okay, So a megaparsec is one million parsecs. Uh, this is a science show, so I'm going to use scientific notation. One million is ten to the sixth. So you see ten of little six up top like that. Uh, it's a one with six zeros after it. Now the history of a parsec is interesting enough on its own, but for today's show I will just let you know that it's pretty big on its own. That's uh, about three and a quarter light years. So that's most of the distance to the nearest star system, to the sun. Uh, so it's 3.26 if I'm going to be kind of precise, and I usually try to be. Uh, so one megaparsec would be 3.26 times 10 to the sixth light years. Simple multiplication. But light years are still pretty big probably still doesn't make a lot of sense to you, so let's take another step. Uh, we want to get down to human scale, so maybe we'll get down to the scale of the solar system at least. Uh, we use something called the astronomical unit here in the solar system quite a bit. Uh, that's the Earth's average distance from the Sun, and it's equal to, well, one light year is equal to about 63,000 astronomical units. So another bit of calculation, uh, it's about 2 times 10 to the 11th astronomical units in one megaparsec. 
the numbers are already getting kind of incomprehensible, but we're not done yet because an astronomical unit still is not really human scale. Uh, that's the Earth's average distance from the sun, about, about 93 million miles. Uh, or again, since this is a, a science show, uh, we'll use the, uh, the standard system of, uh, of measurement and we'll convert that to kilometers. That's uh, so about 150 million kilometers uh, or uh, 150 billion meters. Uh, and again, proper scientific notation, uh, 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. That's just in one astronomical unit. But here with the meters, we finally have something in human scales. Uh, I've actually brought a prop along this time. It's a meter stick. Not very exciting, but uh, these aren't huge. I can hold a meter stick easily between my two hands. It doesn't all fit on the camera, but uh, you've probably seen them before. Uh, it's about the same as a yard for my fellow Americans. I'm about one meter from the camera right now. Uh, average uh, adult males are uh, about two meters tall. Okay, so now we're talking about human scales, finally. Uh, there's one more bit of multiplication to do then. We take 2 times 10 to the 11th times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th, and you get, oh, about 3 times 10 to the 22nd, uh, which, if uh, you like funny sounding words, is uh, almost 31 zettimeters. Uh, if you want it written out, here it comes on your screen. It looks like that. So, that is why I say megaparsecs cannot really be translated to human scale, because uh, that is a, a mind-bogglingly huge number. Um, could I maybe make it easier to understand? Um, let's see. Let me, let me think here. Uh, human terms, human scale. Uh, how about the most distant point from the Earth humans have traveled to? That would have been during the Apollo 13 mission as uh, they were looping around the moon to, uh, to come home. Their greatest distance from our home planet was about 400,000 kilometers. Uh, their trajectory looked kind of like that. So that's the greatest distance from Earth humans have traveled. So if we compare that distance to a megaparsec, uh, on the same scale, let's see, what would stand in for the meter? Um, well, on the other Apollo missions where they landed on the moon, the astronauts wore these spacesuits, and uh, their visors were covered in gold. Uh, now, if you zoomed all the way into the visor, which uh, I can't actually get close enough uh, here on the computer, but if you could zoom all the way into a single gold atom. The nucleus of that gold atom uh, would have about the same scale compared to the trajectory of the Apollo 13 mission as one meter, my meter stick here, does to a megaparsec. So that's probably not really any easier to understand. Uh, okay, let me try again. Um, let's see, let's see, yeah, hair. Humans are mammals, most of us have some hair. If your hair is especially Thin. Think about the width of one strand of hair. Uh, so if we use that as a scale for my meter stick, then a megaparsec is about the same as the diameter of the sun, which is pretty huge. You can go back and see our, our first episode on the nearest stars. We talked about how big the sun was. Needless to say, it's huge. And needless to say, that comparison although interesting, uh, probably still doesn't really put the megaparsec into human terms. So, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, which I showed you a little bit ago, is just shy of one megaparsec from the Milky Way. So almost every other galaxy we see in the universe is even farther away. And Howard's ultimate question was about the expansion of the universe. That's something that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, the universe is expanding all the time. And astronomers measure this in kind of a strange way. Uh, it can be described by something called the Hubble constant, which, oddly enough, is not constant. But that's another story. Uh, the Hubble constant is, in the present universe, about 73 or 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec which is an incredibly strange string of words to say. All that means is that as we look farther and farther into the universe, uh, every time we look at a galaxy that is another megaparsec away from us, it should be moving about 73 or 74 kilometers per second faster. The more distant galaxies are moving faster because the universe is 
expanding. Uh, what does that speed look like? Well, that's about twice the uh, orbital speed of the planet Venus. So I'm highlighting that on the screen for you. Uh, but uh, it's another thing that is kind of hard to, uh, to translate into human terms. It can be difficult enough to just understand why the more distant galaxies appear to be moving farther for us. But uh, I've put a little something together that I hope will, uh, will make some sense of that. Uh, so a few weeks ago when we talked about the expansion of the universe, I put a whole bunch of galaxies on the screen like this. Today I'm going to add a little bit of a grid so we can measure distances. Let's say to start, the distance between each galaxy is one megaparsec, kind of like it is with the Milky Way and Andromeda. Now, if the universe expands here, my little, my little model universe, I'll make it exactly twice as large as it started. And those galaxies that started closest to us at one megaparsec are now at two megaparsecs. So in the period of time we were watching, they moved one megaparsec. That next round of galaxies has moved from two megaparsecs to one, two, three, four. So in the same amount of time, they actually moved twice as far. So that's just a little model to show you how the universe is expanding, why the more distant galaxies appear to be moving faster. Because the, the whole universe is expanding. All the space between all the galaxies is expanding. So it carries more distant galaxies farther away from us faster from our vantage point. It's not so different from something else. It's kind of a, an odd mathematical thing. Uh, a, a rotating record uh, in terms of what we uh, scientists would call angular momentum. Uh, that's constant across the entire record. The whole record spins uh, the same uh, number of degrees per second. Uh, this is the, the Voyager golden record. It was pressed as an LP, so it's uh, about uh, 33 RPMs, revolutions per minute, right? So uh, the whole record spins at that angular speed. But if you think about the actual distance being covered in different parts of the record, uh, the outer edge of the record has to travel uh, around a bigger circle. So uh, you know, the, the, the molecules making up that part of the record are actually moving through space a little bit faster. You're just looking at their speed through space. So that's kind of a strange thing to think about, too. But it really happens with records. It really happens with galaxies in the universe. Which uh, brings me to the next question I wanted to answer. This one goes back a little bit farther into my archives. And it's a simple question, so I'll give it a straightforward answer. Now that we've defined all these units, Pearl asked, how big is the universe? Well, as it exists today, Pearl, all the trillions, billions of galaxies that we've been able to map out, we've got to go a little farther away to be able to read the number on our screen. Uh, we think it is currently some 93 billion kilometer, uh, excuse me, billion light years in diameter. Uh, so being a stickler for scientific notation this episode, 9.3 times 10 to the 10th light years. That's what I'd say. If you prefer some other units, I've got a couple of others to choose from. Went through all that rigmarole to get to megaparsecs, so there you go, 28,500 megaparsecs. That is the current size of the universe uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, that is, again, just huge, mind-bogglingly big. Hard for me to describe that size in uh, a way that makes sense. Uh, but. I think the universe is actually much larger than what we can see. The universe we are able to see is bound by that kind of glowing orb on the screen there. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's the first light to travel through the universe, but there should be more universe beyond that. Uh, uh, the light from beyond the cosmic microwave background just, just hasn't had time to reach us, so, so we'll never see it. So it's really hard for us to say how much larger the universe is. Uh, it might be a few hundred times larger. It might stretch out hundreds of times longer in, in, in all directions. Uh, altogether, it's, it's probably at least... Uh, Oh, a uh, hundred or excuse me, 15 million times uh, more space in the entire universe than, uh, than we are able to, uh, to map out. So, uh, so that's quite a lot of space. The, the universe is really big, but uh, we aren't really sure how big it is. Uh, next question also comes from Howard. Uh, since we're out here seeing how big the universe was uh, and uh, got to the, the, the edge of the observable universe, he asked about when the first galaxies formed, and since the universe was smaller then, uh, how closely packed those galaxies would have been. Uh, well, that is another one that is kind of hard for me 
to uh, to answer. Uh, if I am uh, if I'm doing my math right, uh, it looks like the oldest galaxy we have found. We'll jump back outside of the universe to uh, see its location. Uh, it's got a catchy name, uh, GNZ11. Uh, that's, that's a real picture of it from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's located where that little red square is on our map. So it's it's pretty close to the edge of the observable universe. It's uh, it's way out there uh, uh, right now. Uh, but we think when this galaxy formed, uh, the universe would have been maybe about 8% of, uh, of the diameter it is today. So it's, it's much, much smaller in those days. But based on estimates from observations of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, if all early galaxies were like uh, GNZ11, there should have been plenty of room for all of them to fit. Uh, GNZ11 is estimated to be about 4% the, uh, the diameter of the Milky Way, about 1% of our galaxy's mass. So if all these baby galaxies are very, very small, then they should fit just fine in the baby universe. Makes pretty good sense to me. Uh, but more research is needed. We don't know if this one distant galaxy is actually typical of all early galaxies. We need to get a better look at more ancient galaxies. Uh, we need to see how the first stars formed to really piece that together. Uh, but maybe there are more clues here in the uh, universe as we observe it today. Uh, we had one more question in, yes, uh, in last week's uh, uh, comment section from Howard. It had to do with, uh, with this most distant light that we're seeing here, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, Howard asked, uh, using more advanced instruments with uh, higher resolution, how long would it take to detect changes in the pattern of the cosmic microwave background? Okay, interesting question. So, so the cosmic microwave background, as we see it, uh, the, the, the map up on your screen, was created by the Planck mission. Uh, and uh, this final uh, map from its mission was released about five years ago now. I prefer the kind of monochrome version that uh, you saw before, but it's also uh, commonly uh, uh, created using this, uh, this rainbow color palette. So here are the different colors going from blue to green to yellow to red. Uh, they're just mapping out tiny temperature variations in the, uh, the early days of the universe. Uh, and these truly are tiny changes. Uh, it's about 0 .0000 two degree difference from uh, the deepest blues to the brightest reds here. But, but these tiny temperature changes are, uh, as far as we can tell, what, uh, what led to the large scale structures in the universe, uh, the density differences that uh, helped us uh, create clusters of galaxies and things like that that. Uh, this is a relatively recent map. This is our most up-to-date uh, full map of the cosmic microwave background. Now, I can't tell you what the next full map of the cosmic microwave background can look like, but I can show you an older map. And if you go back another five, ten years, there's another mission in space mapping out this background radiation. It's called WMAP. And the map created by WMAP looks like this. So here it's colored basically the same way. It goes from blues to greens to yellows to reds. And we're still tracing these tiny temperature variations uh, in, the, in, the, in the early days of the universe. But really, these maps are showing the same overall structure. So here's the older map. Uh, look at one of the brightest red areas on this map, or one of the coolest blue areas on this map. Let's, uh, let's shift to the newer map. And the reddest spots are still the reddest spots. The bluest spots are still the bluest spots. The newer map shows us more details. It is a higher resolution image. We can learn additional details from this newer map. But it's showing us exactly the same pattern. Uh, it uh, really is showing a, a snapshot in the history of the universe. It would be a little bit like digging through the attic, finding your grandparents' high school yearbook or, or other old family photographs. And you know, if you study them really carefully, you might be able to, to learn new details like the, the brands of clothing they were wearing, uh, something like that. But you're not going to uh, be able to, to change where people were standing in the pictures or, or put new people into the pictures. You know? uh, the, those pictures already exist. Uh, that was a moment in time, and uh, you're looking at a record of that moment in time. So uh, our newer missions map out this, uh, uh, this moment in the universe's time in additional detail, but we're never going to see changes in the cosmic background radiation. 
if we really want to understand how the universe has changed, again, we've got to look at, at uh, more recent events, closer objects. Look at more of those ancient galaxies. Uh, look at uh, more uh, uh, of the, the earliest stars to form in the galaxy. And uh, so those kinds of things are going to be the topics covered by uh, one of NASA's next big missions. Uh, late next year, a new space-based observatory is scheduled to launch. That's the James Webb Space Space Telescope. Uh, its, its launch has been long awaited by, uh, by astronomers. Uh, it is uh, designed to observe the universe uh, primarily in infrared light. And we talked a while back about the full electromagnetic spectrum and uh, just like the, uh, uh, the first light we were just seeing, the cosmic background radiation, it was originally high energy radiation, but the expansion of the universe has stretched it out into the microwave part of the spectrum. We think the light from those earliest stars, those earliest galaxies would really show us how the universe has changed over time. We think that's been stretched out into the infrared part of the spectrum today. So a nice big space telescope like uh, James Webb here, uh, tuned to observe the, the infrared part of the spectrum, will hopefully be able to, uh, to kind of fill in the gaps in our map, help us see what happened between the, uh, the cosmic microwave background and uh, the extremely distant galaxies that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and other big telescopes in operation today have been able to see. Now the current launch date for the James Webb Space Telescope is uh, is on the calendar for Halloween of 2021, so uh, October 31st. We've got just a little bit longer to wait for that, so I can't give you all of those answers just yet. Hopefully we'll have them in the coming years. So. Uh, as we wait to learn more about the early days of the universe, how it's changed over time, how it might change in the future, it seems like as good a place as any to wrap up for this week. Uh, now, I'll be back next week with, uh, with more to say and more to explore in the universe. And uh, as always, uh, your input can help guide uh, the, the, the future episodes of our series here. So if anything you saw this week inspired a question, uh, please feel free to, uh, to leave those in the comments down below this video. And if you think of anything in the coming week, uh, this show will be archived here on Facebook. You can add comments there as well. I look forward to seeing how your questions help guide our future adventures. So tune in again next week, next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll learn where we are headed next. Uh, I look forward to seeing you then. And as always, until then, stay safe out there and uh, get out under the sky this evening, uh, see Jupiter and Saturn, and maybe catch a sight at the Milky Way for yourself. I'm Justin, and I will see you again next week.